Right, so good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Pim Pavash, and I'm CEO of the Technology Cluster. Uh, welcome to our online audience as well. Um, so uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, so we're not expecting any fire drills or any of that sort of stuff. So should the alarm go off, uh, please follow myself or Ruth, and then it's either behind us or it's going back into the entrance where we came from. Um, toilets and things are next to the entrance as well. Um, obviously, please be respectful of each other in terms of face mask wearing and handshaking and um, social distancing and all that sort of stuff, if you can as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I run the Sales and Technology Cluster. So for those of you who don't know, Sales and Technology Cluster is a not-for-profit cluster support organization. So we're here to help advance engineering, electronics and software businesses. Uh, we do that uh, by helping them with a promotion, with a networking. Uh, we also run special interest groups to bring people together, um, like-minded business leaders um, around different areas of technologies. Um, so that they can embark on collaborative projects and things. Um, but we also help them with their business growth and business support, um, which is obviously why we're here today. Um, so we also do uh, programs together with an organization called Be The Business. Uh, and with them, we offer um, advisory boards um, for SMEs. And we also uh, offer specialist advisors um, that can help you with your business growth. All of that is, uh, is completely free of charge. Um, but we also do that with events like today and programs like today. So for this one, we've partnered up with our friends from uh, British Business Bank. And uh, we're really going to look into um, sort of access to finance and, and really try to paint a picture for you on uh, the various finance options. So this is the first of a series of, uh, of events. And today we're looking at debt funding and equity funding. Uh, we've got an excellent uh, panel and um, I want to hand over now to, uh, to Warren from the British Business Bank to explain a little bit about the bank. And then Lewis will take over to run the panels for us. So uh, please enjoy. Warren, over to you. Thank you, Pim, and uh, really great to be here today. To see everybody in three dimensions is a, an absolute relief as well. Uh, so as Pim said, I'm uh, Warren Rawls. I'm the Managing Director of the UK Network Team at the British Business Bank, and would like to formally welcome you here today to access to finance funding the next level. A few words about the British Business Bank. We're a we're the government's economic development bank. Our aim is to drive sustainable growth and prosperity across the UK and to enable the transition to a net zero economy by improving access to finance for small businesses. My UK network team acts as the bank's eyes and ears, linking with stakeholders and intermediaries in the English regions and devolved nations to help the bank better understand the different access to finance needs and opportunities facing SMEs in the various geographies of the UK, be that Newcastle, Newport, or you guessed it, Northampton. Uh, the bank is 100% government owned, but we're independently managed. We bring expertise and capital to the smaller business finance markets. We don't generally lend or invest directly with small businesses. Instead, we do that through our over 200 delivery partners, such as banks, leasing companies, venture capital funds, and web-based platforms. Business access capital through our partners who, because they work with us, can lend and invest more, especially to younger and faster growing companies. The bank has a number of objectives. I won't go through them all, but there are three that particularly relate to what me and my team do and why we're uh, here today to, to give you an idea. So the first is the bank seeks to identify and help to reduce regional imbalances and access to finance for smaller businesses across the UK. The other is we encourage and enable small businesses to seek the best finance suited to their needs. And the third is we aim to be a center of expertise for smaller business finance in the UK providing government with <laughs> advice and support. So all the information that we gather and we hear, we bring that back into the bank and we share that. Two of the ways that the bank specifically addresses regional balances is through our regional funds program and our regional angels program. In the Midlands, the regional funds program is called the Midlands Engines Investment Fund or MEIF, just rolls off the tongue. MEIF is also supported by the European Regional Development Fund and now provides 300 million pounds of commercially focused finance through the small business loans, debt finance, proof of concept, and equity finance funds. It's collaboration between the bank and 10 local enterprise partnerships in the West Midlands and East and Southeast Midlands, including the Southeast Midlands Local Enterprise Partnership, similar. Uh, MEF, MEIF aims to transform the finance landscape for smaller businesses in the Midlands and to realize the region's potential to achieve economic growth through enterprise and innovation. Over the last two years, through various regional tiers, national lockdowns, et cetera, MEIF has continued to support businesses at all stages and in many sectors across the Midlands and will continue to do so. At the end of November, 
all of the MEIF fund managers have provided 680 investments in 487 small and medium-sized businesses, totaling 150 million pounds, which generated an additional 151 million pounds of private sector leverage. Last year's spending review, the government not only announced a 50 million pound top-up to the existing MEIF program to bring it to 300 million pounds, but an additional 400 million commitment to the next generation of MEIF. Very briefly on the Regional Angels program, this program helps to reduce regional imbalances and access to early stage equity finance for smaller businesses across the UK. The program seeks to increase the aggregate amount of early stage equity capital that is available to smaller businesses with high growth potential. It also aims to raise the profile and professionalism of angel investment activity and to attract further third party capital alongside business angels while generating a market rate of return. As at the end of November last year, 10 commitments had been made to delivery partners under this program, totaling 115 million pounds. And there's a significant pipeline of potential partners to come. Again, in last year's spending review, the government announced a further 150 million pounds of funding over three years to the Regional Angels Program. There were a couple of other uh, announcements in last year's spending review, including a commitment to a startup loans program for the next three years, from this coming April, and of course, the extension of the recovery loan scheme to June of this year. So before we start today's session, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Lewis Stringer. Lewis, I'm sure many of you know, but if you don't, he's senior manager in my UK network team. He covers the East and South East Midlands, including Northamptonshire. I hope you really enjoy today's session. I hope you get a lot out of it. I will be here for all of today. Very happy to uh, network with you over the breaks. But for now, over to you, Lewis. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Warren, and welcome everybody. It's really fantastic to see you all physically and virtually as well. Um, and often, as I said, uh, as a joke, um, please feel free at any stage to say, Lewis, you're on mute, uh, particularly physically, and I'll, uh, I'll either shut up or speed up or ignore you like I normally do and stay on mute. Um, just to give you a bit of a run through, we've got a fantastic uh, first and second panel. And those panels will work for about 35 minutes. And the idea of this morning is that, yes, we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions of the panel, but actually we'd much rather you took the opportunity to join the networking sessions in between the two panels to actually meet, if I dare say, socially distanced the each individual panelist and speak to them because we're starting hopefully to move in that direction. So the first panel is around managing debt and cash flow. It'll run for 35 minutes. We'll have a 10 minute comfort break. There will be refreshments and then we'll move on to a second panel, which is around awareness of equity finance. And similarly, after that event, there will be a networking opportunity for you to meet uh, as members uh, with any of the panelists, hopefully, but also to the bank and, and some of our fund managers in the piece as well. So like any good uh, referee on a pitch, Hopefully this may be the last time you see me um, and, and worry about me because again, it's all about our panelists. So on that note, if I can please move to my first expert panelist. And if I can just ask you to briefly introduce yourself one by one. So I'm going to start with you yourself, Carl. Hi, my name is Carl Walsh. I work for practice in the SMA debt finance team. Thank you. I'm Carl. Hello, my name is Alan Paul. I'm the uh, head of funds for the uh, East Midland for the FSD Group, which is one of the uh, partners of the British Business Bank and Delivery Debt Funding. Thank you. And Ryan. Uh, Ryan Shields, uh, I'm a director in Crossroads and Corporate Finance Team, and we work with owner managers, shareholders, um, and management teams on raising finance, whether debt or equity. Thank you. And Ian, please. Good morning. I'm uh, Ian Mabbott. I work for AMW, a law firm in Milton Keynes and I head up the corporate finance team but personally I'll focus on the finance side of the uh, corporate finance. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Chris. Uh, hi, my name's Chris Bowers. I'm the managing director of Bowers Electrical Engineering Services. Uh, we're an engineering company based in Northampton. Great. Thank you and, and welcome and thank you so much for spending some time. Alan, if I can move to you next. Um, typically FSC Group are a regional fund. You have funds both in the seminar area, but also either side and south of here as well. But can you outline a little bit about your offer, possibly by comparison to the more traditional high street lender? Um, and also explain what, if I said, I think you're an alternative lender, what that actually means to, to the audience? Um, yeah, well, the FSC is actually a community interest company. So we're not a, sort of a, a commercial for-profit uh, lender. We are 
they're looking to deliver to particularly companies that are growing. Um, so the space that we sit in is often the space where the banks don't. Um, we do, we are a partner in the Midlands for the recovery loan scheme um, and also a partner for the uh, Midlands uh, engine as well. Um, so uh, that is a um, 100,000 to one and a half million space. Uh, and we have the East of England growth loan scheme, which is 50,000 to 500,000 for the six counties of East Anglia for anybody that sort of stretches across to there. Um, we also have um, the Greater London um, Investment Fund, and also we run the Cornwall and Miles Distillery. All together, we've got about 225 million of, uh, of funds there. Um, where you are here, um, it's, it's important to know that the uh, recovery loan scheme is uh, out there um, and is effectively the, 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 the government's one scheme that is out um, there uh, for assistance with, the, uh, assistance with the government guarantee. I think it's also important to know that um, that, that is uh, available and all these funds are available for um, businesses that have already taken a bounce back loan or a seed bills there as well. The important thing is, is that you can demonstrate that you can service um, the loan. Um, for a lot of growth businesses, um, uh, the, the banks want to lend on a track <coughs> record and have a demonstration from past performance that you can um, support um, uh, the you know, loan repayments going forward. Um, we're a little different in that we will look at cash flow going forward. So if you can demonstrate that you've got some traction in the market with contracts going forward, you may have a cost hump to get over in order to fulfill um, that, that, that growth opportunity that you've got. That's where these funds, um, we call them gap funds because <laughs> it's a gap in the market, um, probably between where the banks will then um, be probably before equity and venture capitalists will come into the market, um, mm -hmm. but also allows people um, and founders to grow their businesses um, at, uh, you know, before, uh, and get the real value um, of the work that they put in before they then start to look at further equity finance. Uh, in, in you lead me to, I was going to ask you what funding that meant, but you described it what that I could do. Uh, Ryan, if I can move to you next. Um, as Kyle quite rightly said, the last two years we've seen an unprecedented level of borrowing into businesses, businesses having to take debt rightly or wrongly um, for the, you know, um, the first time. <coughs> and those businesses that already have experience of debt probably taking more than they were probably comfortable yes. with, uh, with all the uncertainty. Um, the bank recently launched a, a, a programme which was really about trying to talk about managing that debt coming out of the pandemic. Can you talk about some of the things the businesses need to be aware of in terms of continuing to manage that debt, manage their cash flow, and dare I say it's still be able to grow with those debt and debt management? Yeah, I think it's it's been a really interesting development in terms of you know, a number of businesses not having experience of or effectively external stakeholders. You know, previously if you've got debt finance in there, someone external to the business, you then have to proactively manage and the best way to do that is yeah, to be proactive in that. So communication is key. Um, you know, be aware that you know, a debt financer or equity financer isn't going to be aware of the day to day going on in your business, isn't going to see all the good stuff, but also needs to be managed in terms of if there are bumps along the road. Um, so I think that's you know, good management information, making sure that's getting out to your, uh, your debt finance and your, your lender there. And so you're, and you're having regular catch ups with them to explain the kind of where you are on the journey, whether that's kind of diverged from you know, the initial kind of plan you put together. Um, so I think that's kind of really key for that. I think where we're getting to now in terms of uh, hopefully coming out to the back end of the pandemic, pandemic and seeing some of those packages, you know, the C bills with some of the recoveries, you're starting to repay elements of them now. It's really important to make sure you've got the right debt package for your business. And I think that is about growth. Um, you've got a big term loan and you're starting to make repayments from that. Is that right? You know, that, that cash going into repaying that. Could you have a different package, invoice discount, or something a bit more revolving? The, that money, rather than on a monthly basis going back to the bank, can you get that back into, can you be reinvesting that into the business and using that better? And you can present a you know, kind of well thought through plan 
to your funder and look at the right package and, and speak to them. They'll be able to tell you about the, the packages available in the market and what's right for you as a business and, and your plans. So certainly for a lot of businesses, we're fine with the, both the good and bad reasons as an issue that we find actually structuring with their debt. So the advice is out there from Cathy Films there, I suspect, which is great. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you. Uh, if I can come to, to Chris, Chris, you're a business, you're a business that secured loan funding. So you've gone <coughs> through um, the pay, but you've also gone through the benefits. Mm -hmm. What I'm sure the audience is particularly wanting to know is the there's a perception that debt is bad in some instances that's the case. Mm -hmm. Why did you take external finance loan funding? Why was it the right thing for you as a business? For us, we've got a, a strategic growth plan in place. Um, for our business particularly, we didn't have a sales and marketing team. But we'd always work with the same clients um, and was finding it more difficult to push out into the wider market. Um, so we needed funding first off to, to bring a, an in-house sales and marketing team. Um, we needed funding for machinery because a lot of what we do um, is in-house, but some of it was external. So we was contracting that out. Um, so we're trying to bring that back in-house. We're investing in our employees um, with training. So by doing this, we're making ourselves a much stronger company for our clients. Um, and that was really the reason why we went for it. One of the things that we often face is, is do the businesses know what finance options are available to them? So for us as an organisation, we very much try to position ourselves to provide that information, realising that it's a matter for the likes of the high street lenders and the county firm to provide that. Sitting there, knowing what we have to do from a growth perspective and then realising that I need to finance to do that, how conscious were you of the various options and did you make a constitution? That's the loan funding I want. I want loan funding for X, Y, and Z. How informed did you feel? Um, to be honest, I mean, we we used uh, Graham Hall of Payment, who was fantastic and explained everything all the way through. And we went through different finance packages. Um, but because of what we needed the money for, it wasn't one particular thing. We wasn't just looking for uh, to to fund it for assets or anything like this. We needed it for to hire new employees and and form a new department. Um, so there was quite a few different elements that we needed the money for. So uh, between myself and, and Graham, we came up with the, the best funding option for ourselves. And another interesting thing, you actually, dare I say, had a positive relationship with a funder and was interested in your business, wanting to work with you to grow your business because it's in their interest as well, isn't it? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, still today, I have phone calls from Graham and we, we have chats and it was just such a simple process. It really was. Great. That's good. I'm going to come back to that because I'm sure there are some uh, other things that we can probably discuss around uh, other businesses that are looking at your position. Hopefully, you give some guidance on that as well. And if I come to, to Ian next, Ian, the um, uh, MW law, particularly well placed in terms of the, the seminar area, mm -hmm. not beyond. Um, you come across businesses, you advise them in terms of where they need to be. Tell us a little bit about how you work with businesses to place them in a better position to know what to do and how to take on funding pitfalls. Well, I think the first thing to remember when you're looking at debt funding, particularly if you haven't done it before, is that your business is looking to grow. But equally, the lenders that you're going to be approaching are businesses are now looking to grow. And if they don't lend money, they don't grow. So I think some people approach lenders thinking, you, you know, with a bit of trepidation, but actually that, that just businesses like yours and that got a business plan, they'll undoubtedly have targets to lend to, and therefore you're pushing that at an open door. And uh, I think the, the, the best bit of advice I can give is to be prepared, go, go to that lender prepared, because although it is an open door and, um, and, and lenders will be welcoming the uh, conversation if, if they'll have a number of people that are looking to um, take some of that money and it's not um, an endless pot and actually for the relationship people if, if you're presenting them with a well-prepared business plan and you know we've alluded to some of this um, earlier on in the panel discussion that's you know got got your historic trading it's got your forecasts um, it it shows how you think you're going to be able to repay the debt. Um, it demonstrates that um, you've thought about pitfalls. You know, what if what if interest rates suddenly 
go up? What if um, you lose one of your customers? How would that impact on it? So providing them with um, a business plan that's thought out with uh, a SWOT analysis so you can demonstrate that you know your um, business area really, really well. And, and also don't, you know, just don't pre present a completely glossy picture. If it is completely glossy, then that's, that's fair enough. But if, if there is problems, then be upfront about them. If there's a piece of legislation coming out that you think, oh, it might um, impact on my business, or one of your key directors is, going, um, is looking to move, then just be upfront about it. Because actually by being upfront about it and demonstrating that you've thought about it, it's much better to have it on the table on day one. You know, I talk to a lot of um, relationship directors and what, what they hate doing is going back to um, credit committee two or three times because a new bit of information has come out that's, that's going to um, uh, impact on, on that decision. Legally, is there things you can do? You can because nearly every lender is going to want to do their KYC. So you know, if your statutory books aren't up to date or there's problems at the company's house, and sort them out because it's just going to cause cause problems on the KYC. No, your customer front. Sorry, using that acronym. Um, and you know, if you if you're relying on one or two key contracts, whether it be supply or or um, uh, customer contracts, if if you are focused on a couple, then make sure they're robust because they'll inevitably uh, get looked at. And it comes back. You know, if you if one of your if your customers are Come, or if your customer comes from 90% percent of one person, then that's the thing to be upfront about. That will impact on decisions. And I think the, the final thing is um, is it, it talk talk to people. I've, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I think the, the number of lenders that are in the market now is 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 just incredible. And the opportunities to go out and, and speak to people. And you know, we've got two two lenders two lenders here, but this is the the number. I, I don't think I'd challenge anybody to be able to name all of the lenders that are available um, and do your networking, you know, ask the people that already managed to get some debt finance, I'll ask, you know, ask the people um, that, because if, if it, for instance, if it isn't for Parkers, then I'm sure they'll say, you know, we've seen this before and um, this, this organisation has done it. Speak to your lawyers, speak to your accountants, but really just network because you can waste a lot of time approaching the wrong lender. And then when you do approach that lender, you might want to approach you know, one or two at the same time. You know, if they say no, don't get disheartened. It doesn't mean that your deal's a bad deal. It just means that your deal's not the deal for them. So um, you know, don't get disheartened. There is lots of um, opportunities to take that out there. So Chris has given us a very positive experience saying we'll come back to that, Chris. But before I move on to Ryan, very quickly, why do you think there's that reticence towards taking advice and guidance? Um, because we often hear that a lot, and clearly you know, it's never hard and fast rule, but if you do take advice and guidance, it's a known fact you're going to be more successful, whether it be a loan application or actually a growth in business. But why do you think there's that reticence amongst some businesses about speaking to somebody that can maybe help some find find that or, or not find that in I, I guess there's a perception that um you know we're automatically going to you know start you know particularly professional community start start charging for advice but i i would hope and certainly it's a case at, at the mw that we we treat that as part of our you know business development um uh, activities and actually, you know, if we're just talking to you about, you know, what what um, you know what lenders are, are out there, you know, what we've seen personally has worked for that particular type of lending. You know, is it asset finance lending? Is it invoice discounting? Is it cash flow? Is it a bit of um, property you're looking to do? And then who's out in the market? Then, you, you know, the, there is a reticent, I think, because you know, People think we're going to charge, but the but the the, the likelihood is, and certainly at AMW, we just wouldn't we wouldn't be doing that. We'd welcome that conversation. It gives us an opportunity to go and speak to some of these lenders and um, hopefully provide value to them, provide value to you, and um, 
and that way we we stimulate growth and hopefully opportunities for us in the future. Thanks, Dean. That's really useful. So if I could do Ryan, come back to you yourself and just follow that conversation through uh, moving from a legal firm to an accounting firm. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how a business can make themselves more successful from an application point of view. What types of financial information should they be preparing? Should they already have in place just to make their proposition easier when they when they approach a funder? Yeah, I think Ian's touched on you know a number of the areas actually around the business plan. But it's about having, you know, I guess, challenge yourself and thinking through about, you know, what's your what's your business plan? What's the narrative? How can you articulate that really clearly? What's your kind of proposition in the market? And then, you know, thinking with my kind of accountants, that how does that tie into the the hard numbers? Then, what are you presenting in your forecast? Um, and like Ian said, is you know, making sure what's the fund they're going to want? You know, historic numbers. You know, management accounts, understanding what type of management information, how you manage your business, dashboards, and you know how quickly you can monitor if something is going wrong, with your margins or something else. Um, but also then looking at your financial plans and your forecasts, do they tie into the business plan and what we're hearing about the market? And you know, the key thing for me, as soon as I get someone's forecast and business plan, is you know I'm looking at the I'm looking at the historics, you know, the assumptions they've made in the future tie into the performance they've done historically or has there been a change of conditions you know is it more friendly you know friendly they've won a big customer contract something's changed but can we point to the thing that you know they're growing at 20 percent a year they're forecasting and growing at 40 percent a year what's causing that um and that's what funder will do in terms of you know they will sensitize your model they will test your assumptions make sure they're you know they're grounded and they're, they're sensible and you've got to think of you know when you're with the funders, talking this through with them. And well, as I think someone's mentioned it before on the panel is they have to go up to their own bosses and their credit committees. So you've got to give them the ammunition that they can answer the questions that they'll get. Um, so yeah, it's a long way to go. That's useful. Thanks, Ryan. Let me come back to you, Alan, if you don't mind. So we've had a little bit about how businesses can take advice and guide to prepare themselves <laughs> for funding. What do you as a funder actually look for from a potential applicant? What do they need to provide for you? And talk us a little bit around what's the process and dare I say how long it takes if there's a difficult time step. Well, uh, a lot of it's already been um, uh, touched uh, on uh, really. I think it's it's in, in, important obviously to have the financial information as, as has been and said, the assumptions behind that. Um, but also in terms of the preparation of the business plan has been that's been covered by Ian. Um, yeah, there, there are going to be risks in the business, so have a good list of risks and mitigants. So what you're going to do to uh, alleviate that risk, is it something that you can insure against um, or is it something where you can uh, change direction? But having those, looking that you've done your very best to sort of you know, de-risk that, because it is a risk assessment that we're doing. Um, and even though you're a gap fund or alternative lender, you're still looking for the same level of information, confidence around the viability as, as well as the market. Well, absolutely, because um, we've talked about growth. We're very much looking at, um, at growth uh, businesses there, and it's knowing that those assumptions of growth, um, the distraction in the market, what's driving it, is it specific contracts there? Um, is it uh, growth in an industry? Or is it gross because you know you have a specific product there that is market leading? Um, you know, we see a lot of it in terms of um, you know, green energy and new things that are coming in. Um, that we've seen a lot of in terms of software and services, people are changing that. Uh, some of the drivers may be what we've seen with the supply chain recently, where they're looking at businesses that uh, and suppliers that are closer to home to try and solve. Some of those supply chain problems or have not so, Okay, thank you. I promise to come back to you, Chris. Now's your opportunity. Come on. Uh, I'll hold Graham back. Don't worry, he won't get to <laughs> but I know he's in the audience. Um, but be honest, how did you find the application as a business? And is your opportunity to tell the other businesses here the pros and cons, how they can put themselves in a better position? And you've got some funders here, so give us some feedback for funders. Yeah, I mean, obviously, as I said before, we went through uh, Graham and Maven. Um, but Maven wasn't the first company we spoke to. We actually did speak to Barclays, um, and it wasn't for Barclays. But I thank Barclays because they then put us in touch with Maven. Um, they didn't just end there and say no, sorry, 
you know, go away. Um, they they put it forward to Maven, Graham got in touch, and it was the most simple process. It really was. Um, he kind of held my hand the whole way, if you like, sort of thing. Um, and yeah, it, it was fantastic. So simple. In terms of some of the things that Ian and Ryan have talked about, about business planning, having your financial information, was that readily available or did that require some work on your part? Definitely. Um, we had never got any debt before. And, you know, again, Graham just explained to us what was required. Um, so we um, put our plan in place and, and worked closely with our accountant and got all the figures together um, and went back to Graham. And yeah, between our accountant, myself and Graham, we, we just worked through it until it, it worked. Right, yeah. And I'll come back and ask you what the future holds. Um, so Alan, you probably sit slightly differently as a funder for, for obvious reasons. Are you still seeing the same trends? Tell us a little bit about what you're finding in the local marketplace in terms of demand for finance and all. Um, yeah, we are seeing a lot of demand for, for finance as people have sort of um, I think plateaued or delayed their growth um, during the, the, the pandemic. Um, and now we're seeing people sort of coming uh, back in. Where, where we are is slightly different because whereas you're looking at historic and, and peasants as far as uh, a lender like Barclays is concerned, we're looking at present, future, uh, in, in terms of getting traction in, in, in the market there, in terms of that debt servicing, that's where we're slightly different. Um, so we are seeing those businesses that are looking to, to grow, as I mentioned before, getting over a cost hump, um, or you know just wanting to get an, an extra bit of growth before they then look at equity investment or a higher level of, uh, of growth still. Um, and again, we're, um, we're, we're light security wise in terms of the of uh, what, what's provided um, in our particular area, and so there's there's a faster turnaround there as well. Um, another area that we're seeing is um, trade trade finance as well, um, where we can look at short term facilities there to overcome problems where you know uh, other trade finance providers are probably starting at companies that are at a, at a higher level you know just from a, a safety and profitability point of view so we fill in a little bit of that thank you Ian, if i come back to you before i go back to chris as i promised um it all sounds great so everything's hunky dory everybody's happy everybody's right but there must be some downfalls particularly from a loan funding application particularly if you're lending or borrowing for the first time so can you give us a feel for in terms of that loan documents what some of the typical things that you'd advise the client about making sure they know before they sign up i think before you even get to the loan document uh the important an important document to read properly is the the outline terms conditions or Heads of terms is um, that's the court in other worlds, but um, it, it's quite stark actually between lenders. Sometimes they can be a page long, sometimes they can be 10 pages long. And I think if you're new to the world of um, debt finance, it's perhaps um, you'll look at the number and great and go, great, somebody's willing to um, give me two million pounds or, or whatever you're asking for, and then not read the rest of it. And I think it's very important to read through those terms and conditions. That's the opportunity to, you know, have that first conversation about something that's just not going to work for your business. And it comes back to, um, uh, you know, not having to go back to uh, the, the relationship first, not having to go back to credit because you've signed off a, a set of terms and conditions. There was something in there that you didn't read or didn't quite understand. And uh, it's, con it's got through credit, it's been documented. It's gone into the main document and then actually it becomes a lot harder so and um, particularly if, if they are long-term conditions it is you know the opportunity to crash a lot of this out and sometimes it will just be a few headline terms but not always so don't don't discount looking at the heads of terms or outline terms conditions because it will give us it will give us here to um where the documentation is going when you get the documentation i think a lot of times at, um, at the level of funding we're perhaps talking about in this in this room that we're presented with um, documents that are basically non-negotiable and that's um, pretty bad for me because there's no no need for a, for a lawyer if you can't negotiate them so um, and you know if, if you you know if your business is growing you get to the 200 million pound turnover business then those documents will be fully negotiable um, 
But when, when banks are saying, or lenders are saying non-negotiable, what they don't want to be doing is negotiating the nitty gritty of all, all, all the legal language in there. And if you get a loan document or a security document, you know, there's a couple of bits that are kind of operational and, and the rest of it is very, very, very legalistic. And like I say, you know, if you do grow, then you'll get the opportunity to um, negotiate, negotiate those bits, but to keep costs down, both, both for you and the bank and or, or the lender and the lender normally passes their costs on to you as well. It's great really that there's these standard documents, but ultimately if those standard documents don't work for you um, for a commercial reason, then go back because in, invariably the bank will be happy to vary terms that actually impact on you in, a, in an operational sense, because the last thing you guys want and the last thing that the lenders want is you to sign a document and then in a month's time you find yourself in breach because that's not a good place to be in as a business and it's not a good place to be in for the lender if it could have been sorted out before. Now, you're not going to be able to change a lot, but you will be able to change things that definitely um, impact on your business. So have those conversations. It might be a side letter that's put in place or it might actually change the... Um, the document, but if something's presented to you as non-negotiable, just please still read it and make sure it works in terms of how your business is going to operate going forwards. And finally, I think you know the thing that um, you touched on uh, earlier, Lewis, is and, and would impact on each of the people, um, you as individuals, is if if you are taking lending and it involves a, a, a guarantee, a personal guarantee and you're not familiar with personal guarantees, then please get somebody to walk you through that, that guarantee because um, quite a lot of lenders will require that, and um, particularly in certain circumstances, I want you to get some independent legal advice and, and get a lawyer to say that they've given that, but not always. And I think if you're not familiar with guarantees, then you might be quite surprised as to the impact. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, sign it because that's obviously a commercial decision for you um depending on your own risk appetite but at least you're going into that transaction with your your eyes completely open as to the potential implications of stopping that document great thanks dean we've already got some of your pro bono work this morning <laughs> it is true it's true but i promise to come back to you finally chris it's always great to have a good case study good <coughs> example for the business community it does actually mean a great deal as we know um, so tell us a little bit about what the future holds for your business and the question, would you take finance again to continue that growth? Yeah, I mean, the future is looking um, very exciting. Um, we've now got, like I said, the a sales and marketing team ourselves. Um, and yeah, they're, they're looking at some really interesting possible projects as well as production work. Um, we've just received a huge order and it was only through having the internal sales um, that we managed to get this order just before Christmas. Um, we've invested in machinery, so we've now got our own um, tool tool room, basically, with lathes, milling machines, this sort of stuff. So again, rather than having to stub this work out, we're doing it in-house, which means that we're in control of timeframes, um, making sure that we don't let our clients down. Um, so yeah, the future looks really good. Um, if, would we take funding again? I think, dependent on what it was for, I would, I would always <coughs> think it wouldn't scare me at all. As long as we have the right plan in place, um, and he said it's executed well. Great, thank you. So for the first time I've worked a schedule, um, that's good. You've been very succinct, which is good. But it does mean that I've got some time for questions from the audience, so <coughs> that may be bad. But <laughs> um, so can I ask the audience, if you've got a particular question that you'd like to raise, um, can you raise your hand? I'd like to introduce yourself so that the, the camera can pick you up and, and there's some continuity there. And if you can direct your question, please knock at me. That would be really helpful as well. So any questions from the floor? Oh, silence. Come on, Greg. <laughs> you, you, you've had some free slides from Chris. <laughs> What's your experience working on the patch? My experience working on the, uh, on the, on the patch is you know, it's it's very interesting. There's a huge variety of, of possible business opportunities. The things about the professionalism is important. That if that client worked with some professionals to put together 
decent plan, um, understands where, what that plan means and the implications for them, and they're prepared to deliver that information and, and, and talk, we can come to negotiated settlements and moves around. In, in Chris's case, we did the lending to tranches and the, um, the contract he's just talked about, that's where the second tranche came in. So we put some, if you like, KPIs, key performance indicators in, and we were able to show that the first lend um, led on to the second as a result of him you know, meeting, those object meeting those objectives there. Chris was a real pleasure to, to work with. Um, one of the few clients that delivers stuff that actually looks at, like what they said it's going to be before it arrives. And that's a good thing because you start to shape something in your own mind and then you get information which is doesn't quite match that up. So you've got to go back and uh, work around with it. But it, it was a good, you know, um, try and look between myself, the professional, and Chris. Thank you, Graham. And just for the sake of our virtual viewers, that was Graham Hall from Pedro Capital Partners. Thank you, Graham. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm just going to ask. Um, Apologies, Mark, we've just met, but can I just quickly ask you from a, from a question point of view? I think the mention of trade finance, we know export is important. If you can just say who you are and just give a little bit of information about what your role is with Great Scheme Okay, I'm Mark Ryan, I'm from UK Export Finance, and we've got quite a specific remit to help UK businesses export more. Um, I suppose from the trade finance point of view, it's a question that uh, we get an asked quite a lot. Uh, one of the main um, problems that we come up against is that we run by state aid rules and undertakings and difficulty rules, particularly, which are quite stringent, um, which sometimes means that we're not able to help. So I'm interested to hear from some of the, the lenders there about, especially on the trade finance side, whether you would look at uh, deals where banks and UK export finance couldn't support because of the state aid rules. Things like, because of the trade class, so many businesses have actually lost money in the last year, or well, last couple of years. So I know under the, uh, the, the state uh, rules for the business bounce back loans, deals, etc. you were looking back at sort of 2019 figures as a baseline, or well, the banks were anyway. I'm not so sure that maybe, but I've got a couple of companies where the uh, the tangible network or the net asset for business have contributed so much that they're not necessarily attracted to the banks in, in terms of their overall lending. But it's a case of getting them back on the road again because they've still got the business, they've still got the, just the people from the past which they can really back up to, but they're coming from a, a lower base than they would have done one year, certainly two years ago. I'm going to probably just give the two guys a little bit of a chance to think about that, but because we've got some actually, we're actually there are actually people in that virtual world because they're asking questions through him at the moment. So there's, a, there's an important question there as well. But <laughs> apologies, Kapal and, and, and Alan. Just talk a little bit. This must be difficult when you're looking at historical information over the last two years, and now I say yeah. even the forecast going forwards. How do you factor in the two years that we've had from a financial right. point of view? I think you answer that, Alan. Uh, <clears throat> no, not really, except that I, I, I suppose that you've got to have sensible assumptions there if COVID has, has an impact and you're, you're, you're building back, to, to, to quote that, um, then you, you may be looking at sensitising it to a percentage of certain uh, turnover there. But again, it's down to those assumptions that are being made. They've got to make sense and for you to rationalise everything that is in those figures and for it to be the, uh, the reason why because every business wants to rationalize it for themselves because they're taking the risk there and i think also for those that have taken on speed bills and bounce back loan then again is making sure that the total debt burden if you're taking on more that you're working out your your repayments and make sure that there's debt service cover with a good margin there to sort of protect you against cash flow problems going forward uh, one of the many questions that we've had through, through the, the virtual community and audience is, and I think we've mentioned this, so I'm going to pick on it, uh, personal guarantees. Uh, and clearly, to some degree, personal guarantees are the norm. Um, but obviously, I, I, threw, I threw the statement, debt is bad, isn't it, Chris? Uh, because the perception of debt is bad, but also there's also a perception that I don't want to take a personal guarantee, and he talked about that a little bit. Anybody from the panel have a view? And again, it's probably a question for the entrepreneur, but it's probably not a question we're going to want to ask uh, to the audience now. 
But what's your view about is a, is a personal guarantee or requirement getting in the way of deals or stopping businesses progressing? Anybody want to take that one? I'll take that one. <laughs> um, personal guarantees, <coughs> dealt with them for years in various guises. Um, recovery loan scheme, you have to remember that really a personal guarantee is going to be at support unless you're going an amount over £250,000 per support. So I think that's worth noting. Um, you know, there, there is a lot to be said as far as guarantees um, for um, entrepreneurs having what we, you know, what was a colleague called the skin in the game. Um, and also that we won't necessarily look at a guarantee on some of the gap funding that is for the, you know, the, the full amount necessarily. Um, but it is what is um, you know, sensible. And sometimes that has to be adjusted in terms of who is giving the guarantee, because they may not have they may not be a full owner they may just have a percentage in there so uh so there is a degree of flexibility and then it's looking at the risk to say right, okay if we take a, a lesser guarantee or even no guarantee then you know what is the you know relevant risk to that um i, I failed but again i, I always fail so that's no hard to get them to the timing so um can i ask you to thank the panelists in the normal way please um, and can I thank you as well for your time this morning? So, for those people joining us virtually, we're going to take about a five or ten minute break. I'm overran. We're going to probably come back at 25 past 10. You've got an opportunity to um, have a drink, have a refreshment, speak to some of the panelists if you've not asked a question. But then we've got the awareness of equity panel. So, please come back. It's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, but again, if you'd come back and be seated by 25 past, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, James Syracuse, I'm an investment director at BGF. Um, BGF will describe it a bit later on business growth fund. Uh, so we're an active investor in uh, both early stage growth businesses and also creative businesses as well, all across the UK. Thank you. And Tracy, please. Hi, I'm um, Tracy Evans, legal director at BMW. I'm in the corporate finance team there. And I suppose typically my favourite client is that kind of owner managed business that wants to want to grow and seek investment. And it's about hand holding through the process from kind of seed to, to maybe sale in the future. Thank you. And Chris, please. I'm Chris Wiles. I'm a senior investment manager at Foresight Group. Uh, Foresight's a London listed uh, asset manager at 8 billion assets under management. At 90% of that is renewable infrastructure. 10% is uh, small uh, cap private equity. Uh, we've got a range of plans, which we can tell you a bit about that. Well, last but not least, Dorian. Good morning, my name is Dorian Spenning. I'm the CEO of Total Control Pro. Um, we're a software company. We uh, have a smart manufacturing platform. Um, and I'm here uh, having closed up two equity rounds. Um, thank you. So Ryan, if I come to you first, um, I'm going to take the opportunity whilst you're here to pick your brains and ask for some intelligence here. Coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, um, what do you think the appetite is for investors in the marketplace? Are they there to do deals? And probably more importantly, what's the appetite for businesses to seek equity investment? Yeah, I think um, you know, coming back, that has always been a, a fairly rocky kind of period and various phases of the, of the kind of lockdown, I think, initially. Um, a lot of people were in, uh, when, in terms of investors, were not in new investment phase. Um, they were actually looking at you know, their current portfolios, making sure they were strong and able to continue in their line of business. But I think really in the last, in the last year, the market has really picked up um, in the last 18 months probably. Um, now, so the market is really live. There's a lot of, there's a lot of money out there. So there's a the highest amount of, kind of dry powder as we um, we call it out there in the market. There's, there's pent up demand. People, investors need to put money out. That's their, that's their role in the market. If they're not doing that, uh, you know, they're going to get questions asked of them. Um, so they've had a period of you know, six, nine months at the start of the pandemic where they weren't getting money out the door. So there's a huge amount of appetite for investors. Um, I think there's uh, more focus and um, we're having more robust conversations with them about the sectors they want to be invested in. And the kind of businesses in the areas and you know, kind of what key factors they show. Um, so there's a more rigorous investment process you know, that's come out of the back of that. Um, and I think in terms of the appetite from SMEs, um, I think that's still, you know, I think that's still really high for different reasons. People are 
um, looking for investment, either you know, it's been a rocky road, actually, is now the time to de risk my position a little bit, take some cash out, uh, make sure uh, you know I'm fine for the future. Is it now that there's plenty of opportunity in the market? Um, do I kind of capitalize that and take the boards, and do I need to raise growth capital, um, equity capital to, to really go and do that, take advantage of that? Um, and then others that are seeing actually having a partner on board is the right way for them to go and there's the succession in their business um, you know i think everyone uh, looked at their role more in the last couple of years than they did probably in the prior five to ten years in uh, a bit more detail so yeah huge amount of appetite for investors and i think uh, you know likewise the way huge amount of appetite for smes to go and take that investment and, and grow okay thank you i can back to you to, to tease some of those things out if you put you down mind later but when i come to you next chris can we talk about that 10 percent of full science business which is around private equity if you don't mind and some of you will know i always ask that silly question that i ask um what is equity investment just in case there's nobody there that knows equity investment. i guess i'd sort of simply describe it as uh, receiving an injection of capital into your business in return for giving over a, a share of ownership I think equity can suit uh, equity investment can suit businesses at a lot of different stages. So uh, we work with um, early stage companies that are pre-revenue uh, who aren't able to go and get debt finance. Likewise, there might be other companies that are revenue generating but don't have the cash to fund uh, growth through their, their cash flow. Um, and equally, equity investing might be suitable for uh, sort of owner managed businesses who don't want to give the personal guarantees that we've obviously spoken about a fair bit already. Um, Forza has a range of funds which cover uh, those types of. Uh, scenarios through venture and growth and we also have buy-up funds which are suitable for uh, owner managed SMEs that might look into to unlock some of the, the harder uh, work they've put into the business and grown over, over previous years. Can you talk a little bit about the particular fund that you're involved with? And, yep, for sure. Yeah. So, and also the regional fund as well if you don't. Yeah, so I work uh, a specific focus on the Foresight Williams Technology Fund. It's a partnership with Williams Advanced Engineering and we look to invest in early stage advanced engineering deep technology businesses. Um, typically at the kind of seed and series A stage. Um, that's a, a sort of one of the early stage funds within Foresight. We also have several regional funds. Um, so Foresight operates one of the uh, Midland Engines funds, which my colleague Ray, who's the back row, uh, manages. Uh, we also have a fund focused on the east of England that also covers the Northampton area. And we also have several um, sort of more generic BCTs. So the, the STC patch is, is very well served by, by Foresight's range of funds. Thank you, Chris. That's really detailed. Thank you. James, come back to you now. Um, BGF, explain a little bit about what BGF model is, why it's set up. I'm guessing you're probably slightly later stage than some of the early stage funds we talked about earlier. Yeah, that's right. So, so Business Growth Fund, um, we are um, actually the most active from the volume point of view investor across the UK. So, um, last year we made 67 investments and invested about 596 million across the UK. Um, 16 offices across the, the, the country um, and really we were set up 10 years ago now um, I've been lucky enough to be at BGF 10 years as well and um, seeing what was an idea on a piece of paper led by the government and the banks at the time the main high street banks in the UK to really fill a gap in the market for um, minority growth capital investment so um, you hear lots of words today might have heard lots of words in the past you know buyout growth capital VCTs and so on but BGF specifically focuses on um, established but growing SMEs. We're always a minority investor, so we never take more than 40%, which is slightly different to um, lots of investors out there who typically will look for a majority position. Um, and we're able to invest across the spectrum. So um, we have an earlier stage business, uh, which typically is disruptive tech, uh, life science businesses. The bulk of our business is growth, so businesses that are through that initial growth stage, heading towards the four, five, six million turnover and above. Uh, and then we have a quoted business as well. So we're investing in businesses on the AIM market specifically. I suppose the beauty of that is being able to see businesses throughout their journey. So we can invest early doors, grow with that business, continue to fund that business over a period of time, quite often on our own as a sole investor, but, but quite often at the same time working with, with other investors, um, certainly at that earlier stage. Yeah. So, um, a specific niche of, of the market but actually in 10 years that we've been around we've, we've created a size of the business and invested just over three billion now in that period in uk smes strange times full stop but actually what's really interesting is that 
you know, there have been a large number of businesses that have really struggled through the pandemic. Uh, particularly sectors of those of those, those businesses, but we've also seen possibly a relatively small number of businesses that have pivoted, grown, taken opportunities, etc. Um, it's strange, isn't it? But I'm guessing you've had a busy year, actually. Have you? It, it's been really busy. Um, so we we do work in calendar years as well, so that's that's quite handy. But if, if you look at um, the last three years, I think 2019 uh, we invested about 450 million. That was our record amount at that point. COVID hit in 2020. We continue to invest through that that journey uh, or that that time period, 300 million that year, and actually FY21, 600 million. So we've really seen a pickup off the back of I think restrictions ebbing and flowing, of course, you know, easing over the year as it's gone by. Um, but I think it's just a hunger out there for entrepreneurial SMEs to continue to grow. Um, but I think what the pandemic's taught a lot of businesses is actually you, know, you can hunker down when you need to, but actually uncertainty can bring opportunity and actually those more entrepreneurially minded individuals who see a real opportunity to keep growing or potentially now is the time to maybe take their funding take equity investment consider the strategy to take that opportunity and, and maybe take advantage from the situation and, and really look forward three to five years and say well what could we become if we take the plunge today so yeah lots of activity and a bit like uh, trying to pick Ryan's brains a little bit. You sit in the Mel Keynes office. Are there any trends that you're seeing in terms of deals coming through? Is there sectors that are interesting or the types of businesses? Um, some trends. Um, so uh, you wouldn't be surprised for me to say, um, I think during the, the pandemic, you know, those businesses that were in sort of IT, managed services, healthcare really did well. Um, others struggled. So more traditional manufacturing businesses typically, typically struggled. I think from, from our point of view, um, we are seeing lots of interest at the moment, as I said before, in, in, in investment to fund the growth over the next three to five years. Typically, there might be some de-risking going on, as, as Ryan talked about, so maybe some people are taking some money out as part of the transaction. But actually, lots of entrepreneurs are saying, actually, we see a real opportunity, we're going to take money in. Yes, that might dilute our equity stake a bit, but actually, we're still going to control our business. And by diluting, we're going to end up with a smaller slice, but of a larger pie in three to five years' time by really aggressively growing. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, if I come to you next, uh, we heard right at the start from, from Warren, my colleague, that, that actually part of the role of the bank is to look at regional disparities. Give us a little bit of a feel of how the Stemma Perry and your Fantinshire, Milton Keynes are served by the equity investment market. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so EMW have quite a large corporate team and I don't think I'm alone in saying that uh, we do think that regionally there is definitely investment opportunities out there. Investors are aware that they need to give time and attention to, to regional hubs. I still think there is, in some aspects, some difficulties in, in accessing that finance. And that's where the professional advisors come in, in, in to play in terms of preparing those businesses and giving them the right education to know where to start on that journey. Um, I would definitely say, you know, Clients have asked sometimes have anxieties about the whole process of the equity finance process. It is about preparing your business, making sure it's ready, making sure it's in order. I know the panel earlier today touched on that kind of the key preparation, making sure that the nuts and bolts of the business are all in work in order. Um, it might be that you have a great product, but if the back of the house of the business is not in order, then you might create some blue blocks for yourself in the future. Again, it's about fit. So, um, Jane said about kind of they're quite niche in terms of some of their sectors they work with. So, if you have a business in a particular niche sector, um, it's almost educating yourself on those investors that understand that sector, know that market, but equally give you some you know experienced knowledge to help you in your growth going forward. So, knock on the right doors, and you might not get so frustrated with the process. And, and generally we see if you've got a policy business, if you're ready for finance, then, then it is there. But I think you know, that, that preparation is key. Being part of this kind of technology cluster, this group alone, there's such a wealth of knowledge in it. So use your contacts, use your resources. And, and again, in the marketplace, there's, there's a great number of different, whether it's um, industry bodies or professionals that, that can help you on your way. 
Thanks, Tracy. I'll come back to you a bit later on just to drill down to what investment readiness actually means in reality, if you don't mind. But before we do that, can I just come back very quickly to Chris and James a little bit? So um, you talked about some types of businesses. Can you just expand on the types of businesses that you like to see in the marketplace? What's your hot spot? What's the sweet spot for you in terms of types of businesses? It can be separate, it can be stage of business. Can you just retry that for me? Uh, James, maybe, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, of course. So um, from BGS point of view, we're, we're pretty much sector agnostic. So we do invest across most sectors. Um, obviously, where we are here, there is typically more technology and specialist engineering. Um, that's great. We, we like investing in that. Um, what do I look for? I suppose, first and foremost, it's, it's the people that we're backing. So what's the quality of the team? Um, you can have a great business, but actually the people running the business make that business. And so um, that's really, really important. Um, so a good team, um, a business can be, uh, I suppose, ready for investment, but not investment ready, is a phrase I use quite often. Um, they know they want to raise funding, but actually they haven't got the ability to raise it because the data is not in shape. And in the debt conversation earlier on, that was you know, one of the topics as well. But I can't stress enough, actually, um, getting the house in order, so to speak, not from a, a kind of market facing point of view, but just having data available for whether it's a bank or an equity investor, to actually be able to really understand and that comes back to good quality management information and a, a well articulated plan as well you know we can all sit here and say look on this size now five years time i want to be x but actually how are you going to get there how are you going to unlock that what funding you need to do it what does that mean how do you backfill your management team all these sorts of things so first and foremost um growing business interesting market opportunity and team they're the, the real kind of focus areas for me um, and as I say sector agnostic so across our portfolio 350 odd investments in the BGF portfolio at the moment every sector aviation engineering um, IT leisure retail healthcare so interested in all of them apologies Chris it's always difficult going <laughs> yeah. second isn't it well, 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 anything to add yeah well I, I mean the the fund I specifically work on, we're looking at those kind of early stage, more venture type deals. And a couple of questions we ask ourselves there is, um, have they developed a technology which has got an order of magnitude improvement over the status quo? So very often, if you see something which is five or 10% uh, improvement, it's unlikely that you're going to see customers swapping. If they develop something which is 10, 100,000 times faster, that's where we see that there's something really exciting. We then like markets which have got huge um, addressability, either through licensing, partnerships, um, uh, or sort of other scalable business models. Um, and then again, to James's point, it really is all about the team. When, when you're trying to get a company off the ground, it's, it's a combination of um, those visionaries who've got the ambition and, and the belief to take it all the way. Um, and I sometimes like to use the expression of a maniac and a minder, you know, sometimes an experienced chair or someone who might have been there before, but also helps to kind of temper that energy and, and uh, push it in the right direction. So if, if you find all those three, then normally we're, we're falling over ourselves to. Uh, to, to write a check, but uh, as are others. Um, and so then very often then it becomes um, about the sort of personal relationships that you can build uh, with, with the management team over, over the investment process. Thank you. Apologies for that hot there. Yeah. Um, Dorian, welcome. Um, you reminded me we met five years ago. And we did. It's far better than mine. <laughs> uh, thank you for being so kind. I'm sure I wasn't worth it. Um, your business has recently raised equity finance. So give us a little bit of feel for your journey through that process, why you chose equity finance. And in the same way with the debt funding, debt is bad, personal mm. guarantees don't want to touch it. Equity finance, you lose control of your baby then. Well, it was great, great question and, and thank you. Um, so just to sort of wind the clock back a, a few years, we, you know, we were um, a small, SME company with, with large vision, large ambitions, and we were developing technology that was starting to, to disrupt the manufacturing sector. So we had a great traction, a lot of excitement, and um, we were we were taken under Innovate UK's uh, wing, and uh, we had the opportunity to, to bring in some debt funding um, at, uh, at that point in time. And the reason why we, we then looked at equity funding was because there was a requirement to actually to, to dovetail that, that that debt with um, supporting and strengthening the balance sheet with, with equity. So that started off a, a journey and uh, yes, a, a chance encounter actually with, uh, with Lewis here actually really supported us uh, with that. Um, but the, the, the question that you're asking um, was 
it's very relevant as, as we've heard um already from, from, the, from the panel but from the other side of the perspective from an entrepreneurial perspective when you go into this this experience into this market you don't know what you don't know you know the thing that you do know is that it's like a little bit like if you give the analogy you know that you're going to create some kind of marriage of sorts um but you don't know are we are we investable are we attractive what does attract you know what, what does being attractive look like what are these guys going to ask what does investor ready actually mean and you've got a series of these unknown uh, questions and um and certainly i think the, the first role as uh, as the entrepreneur is how to get all those unknowns to a known so when we go and start dating these guys <coughs> we have some chance of having a good conversation thank you not concerned about losing your baby absolutely i mean uh, you know from any entrepreneur's perspective is you know one arm two arms one leg um you know what's it going to you know how much of our company we're we actually going to need to sell um but i think for for us that was less of a conversation because it made strategic sense and we always understood this journey of having a smaller slice of the bigger pie and i think if if that's clearly articulated as a strategy across the you know the, the founding directors or the um, the founding stakeholders then then that's certainly a big tick in the box um but i suppose you know what's uh, what is very relevant to uh, to consider is you know what is your company actually worth you know what who with who do you need to have what conversation <coughs> to actually to articulate the value of of who you are going forward and how does that value conversation play into coming back to the likes of the funders to actually justify what they're willing to pay what we're willing to sell and bring those meeting the minds together thank you tracy of course to come back to you i'm going to come back to you tell me a little bit about how emw actually practically help businesses to become this investment readiness thing certainly um i suppose from what we don't want to see is a process starting and the investor having confidence in the management and in the best in, in business and that confidence being eroded over time through them finding out particular weaknesses in the businesses so before you go to you know approach investors or an early stage we do offer almost like a health check service so that will be working with yourself and just to look at you know do all your employees have the right up-to-date suitable contracts are they signed is your material supply contract are they suitable are they in place um, from a tech perspective ip is your ip properly protected are the processes in place that might streamline the business do you own the, the concepts that you use so it's about making sure because we're aware that when the investor starts looking at the business it will carry out quite a lengthy diligence process we want to, to, sh to show them that all of these things are in order and for all of them you know for them to continue having confidence in that business or it will be a, a longer process it might be that there's a couple of red flags that can't have an immediate resolution so again as my colleague Ian said it's about flagging those early enough in the process to make sure they're not a stumbling in block later down the line um equally what what we do I suppose is, is understanding your needs as the, the business owner and then the needs of the investor and it is preparing those documents that hopefully to be fair and balanced and setting out i suppose so the parties know what's expected of them going forward and documenting that thank you thank you tracy if i come back to you ryan if you don't mind do you agree with some of the things that tracy said and put it in the context of how an accountant or a corporate finance advisor supports a business to raise investment funds? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Trace is absolutely right with her points in terms of, um, you know, articulating a bit of that investment ready um, kind of on what, what you need to do. I think the key for us in terms of uh, from a corporate finance piece and how we work with businesses is, um, I think we focused a lot about the, you know, the finance piece and the equity finance. There's, you know, there's a whole range of investors out there there's a huge amount of options as the work with debt as well um but the investors are you know they've got access to different elements of value add piece it's not just the cost of money for you it's they're going to work collaboratively in a partnership with you moving forward but they've got access to huge networks you know like jane and chris have said about the number of investments the amount of money they put out over a long period of time so they've got great expertise great networks etc how we work with you know businesses and sme and owners etc is working out 
which investors then have got that track record in your sector, have got the real interest, they're going to understand it. And when you go and talk to them about the growth plan, what you want to do, they're going to be right, right on board with that as well. And, you know, what that boils down to in terms of with us is, you know, working out the best deal for you. So whether that's, um, you know, headline valuation, whether that's actually structure, you know, percentage that you have to give up, or actually the ongoing relationship. And it might be that you're willing to give up a high percentage this time or willing to take on more because the partner you're about to go forward with has got a real value add and it's growing that bigger, you know, that bigger pie. Thank you. It's really useful. So if I come back to you then, Dorian, because again, you know, tick box the British Business Bank, we're all about increasing options and bringing new people to marketplace. But hey, if the market was confused beforehand for an SME and maybe it's confused even more. So tell me how you navigated identifying investors in your business. How did you do that beauty parade? Um, so the funds have been already made, I think, are very, very important. We've talked about investors already. Um, we've talked about, you know, who um, who in your uh, network can actually support um, you in, in understanding what's required in evaluation. I think the first, well, the first step that we took, and again, it was instigated by many of the people actually sitting around the room, by, you know, by connecting with our network and saying, look, who can actually support us for this conversation? Who are they? How can we um, have them support us? Um, and whether it's going off to you know, having a conversation with some of the Scale Up Institutes or Innovate UK or many of the colleagues, indeed, that are, that are sitting around the room, um, that was an important part of the journey for us. You know, we, we engaged with, um, uh, with, a, with a Scale Up Institute that supported us with the processes that you've already heard, making sure that we had uh, uh, sufficiently our ducks in a row, sufficiently investor ready, that we had, had the plans actually set out. But I think that's a really, really important part of, um, of the part of the process that we went on. And I think without that, I think certainly we, we would have struggled. Uh, and can I ask you that question, just following on from you losing your baby, it's going to keep using that phrase. No, but, but actually, let's look at it more positively. What do your investors add to your business or how they accelerated your business or given you new opportunities? And this, I don't think, this is this necessarily something that, uh, that I think is widely enough talked about um, from my perspective. I, I, I do consider it like a uh, like a marriage of sorts. And when you know the money, the funds, they come, they get spent, they grow, but the relationship still remains. So um, I've always looked at this slightly slightly differently in the sense that the money is great, but what else can that relationship bring to the table? And from us, um, we've got some terrific shareholders that are part of you know, AI and tech funds um, that although, albeit that they are uh, investing on a personal basis into our company from the board they are an enormous contribution and, and we, we actually set up and we are a little bit of a demand of our investors in the same way as they're a demand of ours so we report back to them but we also put some structures in place where we actually go to our investor base some of them are more willing than others but that's that's all absolutely fine but um uh, but they have been as valuable to us as a company as actually any other stakeholder across the organisation. And I think that's, from an SME's perspective, that's, that's, um, that's something that we took on board rather than being actually dictated down by, by the investors themselves. Thank you, that's great. Um, if I come back to, to Chris and James, um, what piece of advice and guidance probably can give you one do, one don't, or a top tip would you give to a business seeking to raise investment? And Chris, I apologise, I'll put you <laughs> first this time. Uh, I mean, I think that we've touched a lot of great points today, thinking about what else does the investor bring other than just money. Something that I, I perhaps recommend is if you think about the entire funding journey, um, and especially for equity investment in, in high growth businesses, which are cash consuming, you might need multiple rounds. It's always very tempting to try and go out and get the highest valuation uh, at the first round. But if, if you're then unable to sustain that in future rounds, it can be really very painful and down rounds can kill businesses. Um, so what I'd recommend is you think about kind of value inflection points and both those technical and commercial milestones that you expect to hit through product development and customers and revenues and trying to align those with the kind of when you want to raise money and the types of valuation that you think you could you could justify each of those. Um, so that would be my recommendation and I think it's, there's no harm in speaking to, to investors to articulate the whole journey. It might very well be that the investor isn't right for you at the round for raising now but in subsequent rounds they could be the perfect match. And something else I'll add is just um, uh, 
but yeah, I think um, you know investors are looking for, for different things at different stages. So it's one of the best forms of diligence an investor can do is time. So if we see a business early and then we see them deliver on those promises, two years later they'll be falling over the field for themselves to invest. Thank you. James, has Chris left you anything? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, so I think two, two key things for me, you know, in addition to what Chris has said that I think first of all, we touched on it already. So you know, don't don't go to the market to look for the funding until you're ready to. Um, but also when you are ready and you do go to the market, don't present something that is just unrealistic because actually that can put people off. So of course you want to present your business in the best light, but fundamentally putting a plan out there, we're going to hit the moon in five years' time, and actually you don't get anywhere near it. You know, that's going to be more damaging for your business, not only from an external point of view, but with your sort of relationship with your investor as well. So the, the worst place anyone can be fundamentally post-investment is immediately behind the plan that's been presented. So um, I think be ambitious, but be reasonable and sensible and, and probably cautious in equal measure at the same time, because you don't want to put people off. You don't want to instantly be on the back foot with a relationship marriage that you've just consummated when you sign the deal. Um, so I think be sensible. Thanks, James. I'm going to come to you finally, Dorian. What does the future hold? Uh, would you do it all again? Yes, it's we will be doing it all again. I'm, 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 I'm very confident of that. But the uh, the issue that we've raised to date will will help us exploit and expand within the UK market. But we've really got to arrive on what that means for us internationally, and it will mean coming back to I'm sure the, the marketplace and, and present a bigger offering. Um, so yes, I'll do it again. And um, I think. Uh, would you do anything different? Yes, yes, I, I would. I think um, realistic time scale expectations. I think is, is certainly something that, a bit like my experience of buying a house. You know, the state agent says, "Oh, you'll be in there in six weeks," and then you know, three months later, you're still wondering when it's ever going to happen. But all joking aside, I think it's better to overestimate the time um, rather than you know, we've all got a job to do. We've all got a day job. Um, so to be realistic around the time scales. Um, but I, I would also heed to a lot of the advice that we've heard from the panel here. Um, network, absolutely key. I mean, there's so many people in the room that have supported us on the journey. Speak to people that have gone through the journey, not just once, but two, three, four times. Um, you'll, certainly, I've learned a huge amount uh, from that. Um, so I think they're, they're, they're the two takeaways that I would be keen to share. Thank you. I've worked hideously over time, but I did start like that's my defence. Does anybody in the audience have a question before we go to networking? So, could, you, could you say who you were? If that's okay. Oh, yeah. Mike James, the guy who consulted. I'm just, just wondering about. Um, still not with, you know, in the tech community. And there's this, this constant thing about, you know, scale, 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 VCs, VCs, VCs. And there's an abundance of entrepreneurs and there's an abundance of VCs, angel investors. What we see in a constant trend is the overvaluation of companies, and what do you think that presents as a challenge um, to, to the industry really, definitely investment? Valuation. I'm going to direct it at Chris and James, if you don't mind, unless anybody else wants to take that question. I don't. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd sort of repeat my own point that kind of an overvalued business can, you know, can, can almost kill you at the next round. And when you're raising money on just the narrative of this is what we hope to achieve you can raise money and there's a lot of money out there and there's a great kind of angel and seed investment community the challenge is as you progress you have to start you know people start looking to the proof points and and as you get more mature that increasingly is around financial performance and so you know you, i mean there are other methods that we're using in pre-revenue which is looking at the venture capital method so what would i value at today to try and make a 10x return in the future Equally, a late stage business is more focused on kind of revenue multiples or EBITDA multiples. And if you don't have those to back up your valuation, then you can find yourself in quite hot water. But there was an interesting anecdote on, on Twitter that was, I think, a Dropbox raised their Series C round at 10 billion and they've grown their revenue 10,000 times and they're valued at nine and a half billion. Now, <laughs> so, you know, it's the valuations can, can run ahead and, and not necessarily keep up over time. Yeah, I think it's that overrating the pudding. I think the um, similar, similar point, you know, there's, there's been lots of businesses where almost the, 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 the sort of excitement in the market, the amount of investors interested in the business has just not only inflated their own expectations of the worth of their business and, and the expect, expectations of what might happen in the future, 
but also it's, it's it's put a lot of people off at the same time because actually the right investor for that business might look at it and say, well, actually, I'm just, I'm just not interested because frankly, I can't substantiate that valuation. Um, there might be loads of people interested in it, but you know, good luck to them. And unfortunately for that business, that might mean that the, the ideal investor for them that's going to bring more than the money that, that people talk about um, is just put off at the start. Can I, can I ask, I'm going to come to you, Ryan, actually, yeah. Tracy, because we've heard from the funders and they're going to stay what the funders it's just, Yeah, just from, a, from an advisory perspective, because we have to navigate this at shareholders own emergence, you know, telling someone how much they're, we think their business is worth, and ultimately it's how much the, you know, the market finds it. The important piece, I always think in terms of when you're dealing with investors, is to, to understand the investor and, and reference them from their track record of when you have bumps along the way, what happens. Is it the investor that you know, throws money and can commit to that high valuation? But actually, if you have a bump along the way and you're not begging the money, they will drop you and you will no longer be, you won't get support, you won't get all that value add that you're expecting. Or actually, do you have, and it's about getting options on the table, you may look at a lower valuation, you may look at that, but that funder will understand the journey and be with you along the way. And it's, yeah, it's, the risk and reward piece and taking a call on in terms of where, where in a business owner feels comfortable there. Anything you want to add, Tracy? Yeah, I suppose just going back to the carbon piece that um, Tony mentioned, sometimes this does take a long time. <coughs> so if you have some short term projections and forecasts, and actually the transaction does take three to six months, and already you're falling behind on those projections, it doesn't stand you in good light. So, you know, they can talk to you, but they still need to be realistic. Because that's when you might have incurred, um, you know, we try to be flexible on fees, but if you've incurred legal fees and then we're getting close to it, but you're just not meeting what you said you're going to meet, all their sales just keep wrong. And if they pull out, you've just got kind of some professional fees to pay. So it is about being realistic at the outset to, to make that transa transaction as smooth as possible to completion. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask again you to thank the panel in the usual way? Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a networking opportunity. I think we can refresh refreshments. That's right. So there's an opportunity for you to grab them before they disappear um, to, to speak to those people. Um, it just leaves it to me to thank Pim, um, Trudy, and the team at STC for their uh, desire to work with us. And thank you. It's been great after probably about five years of worth of discussion to actually, to actually be able to do something despite uh, the trials and tribulations of the past year. But, but genuinely, on behalf of Warren, I thank you very much. I'm going to leave you to do some technical stuff before we leave the audience. Sure. So thank you. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Um, so as uh, a lot of you will be used to um, us by now, uh, when we finish our, uh, our event, we, we always like to invite uh, feedback um, on the event. So if you all wouldn't mind scanning the QR code and completing the questionnaire, um, that's kind of like the prerequisite to uh, get the pastries and the cheese and coffee, please. Uh, if the online audience could do that as well, please, um, you should be able to scan it from your screen. Uh, screen. Uh, it will literally only take a couple of minutes. It's, it's no big deal at all. So, and, and it is very helpful, not just to get your views on, on the event today, um, but also on what you would like to hear from us in, in the future and what you would like us to cover and stuff. So, so do give us that, that feedback. Um, while you all do that, I just wanted to um, sort of point out a future date for your diary as well. So um, as I mentioned right at the start, this is a series of events that we're, we're looking to organize. Uh, so actually on the 14th of July, um, we have another one of these events coming up, uh, which will only be about um, funding innovation. Um, so we kind of touched upon this today, but you know, if you have any uh, sort of inspirational uh, projects or if there's new technology that you want to develop, you know, what are your options to fund that? You know, how can you go about that? Where do you turn to and, and who should you talk to? And similar to what we did today, we will try to bring all those people in the room together. So you know, join us for that one, either online or, or in real life, of course. Um, so um, that's kind of uh, everything. So Lewis, thank you very much for, for all your hard work putting together. Warren, thank you very much for, for joining us and, and supporting this. Thank you all for being here and, and for, the, for the questions. Um, as per usual, what we do with the SEC is we'll send everybody an email um, with the contact details of the, of the panelists um, and a recording of the, of the event as well. So there's, there's lots of opportunities to, to follow up. Uh, but also don't forget that we as the SEC, we're, we're here to help. So if there's anybody on the panel or even in the audience that you would like an introduction to or anything like that, please reach out to the team and we'll facilitate sort of that. Um, and with that, I think we'll uh, allow everybody to um, get some 
um, some pastries and some cheese and coffees, uh, whether you're in this room or at home. Uh, hopefully you've got some cookies at home. Um, so please enjoy and thank you very much for joining. Thank you.